Welcome back to Infinite Scroll. I'm Lauren. I'm Jordi, and these are the biggest stories on the internet this week. But first, what content did you consume? How was your week this week? Well, we are recording a day late. <laughs> so the start of the week was not great. <laughs> We recorded our entire episode. It was two hours long yesterday. Ripped it off the camera, went to the office. We got our sushi for lunch, settled in to edit. And as soon as I uploaded it, I noticed that like something just looked different with the file. And basically our audio was recording camera only because the cord that we use that connects to our mics was broken. It was basically like an L shape. It was so broken. We didn't realize until we got Sean to like look at it to try and figure out what the problem was because we were at the office and he sent a photo of the like plug for the cord and he was like, what the fuck? Did you think that this was going to work? We're like, we didn't know. We didn't know. So yes, sorry for the delay in the episode. But other than that, that chaos... My week has been good. It's so weird having to like redo everything. We've only had to ever do this like once or twice, but I don't know. It just feels so weird. But anyway, so major update. Yes. On Friday, Sean and I signed the contract for an apartment. So exciting. So we are exiting our rat era. I was literally about to say the same thing. We are leaving the rat era behind. We are. So he's probably going to kill me for announcing this on the podcast before we've like actually settled and all of that. Or not even settled, but like it's not even, we're like in the middle of the cooling off period now. So like we are still very early days. So I mean, this could change, but I don't really care. You know, if it changes, I'll just let you guys know. (laughs) Like, I don't, I don't really care. Um, But yeah, so very exciting. And then we celebrated on the weekend and that was really fun. But I mean, I've literally already told you this, so it's not a surprise to you, but I am also in my sober era. I just feel like after this weekend of celebrating, it just made me realize that like, I'm in such a weird headspace right now when it comes to alcohol. And I just feel like we have talked about alcohol a lot on this podcast in this past year. And I think that's a lot because I've been like grappling with the fact that like I get a lot of health anxiety around alcohol just lately. Like it's not always been like that. Mm. So I've just decided for my own mental health, whether I have like one wine or 20, I think about it and obsess over it. And I just get really like in my head about it. So I just need to take a step back. So I'm going to do dry July and see how I go. Yeah. And As well, I think a lot more people, I've had a friend recently that's kind of followed a similar pathway and she said, look, I'm going to try and do a month, but I'm not committing to, you know, I'm not desperate for a drink again on August Mm -hmm. 1st. Like I'm just going to wait and see how I feel. And if I'm really enjoying it, I'm happy with how I feel. I'm able to kind of cope in a social situation, then hopefully I'll be able to extend it. But Mm -hmm. it feels much less scary than saying I'm not drinking indefinitely. Yeah, for sure. Just kind of taking those baby steps. And then I think that'll probably help you feel, figure out where you feel your best and like what you're able to manage like emotionally Mm -hmm. and like health wise and stuff too. I think it's a good step for you. I think it is. And like, that's the thing is I, I don't, think that I need to be sober, you know, like in my entire life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think in this like season of my life, alcohol is like fucking with my mental health. So I just need to say no more. It just feels like a massive decision in your like late 20s, early 30s, because that is kind of the period that almost everyone is like binge drinking the most, but doesn't realize they are. It's like normalized. Like when you're 18 – probably 18 to 25, it's like, okay, amazing. We're all going to go out to this club or this party and get shit faced. Whereas when you're like the age that we are now, I constantly find myself like going out to dinner with the intention of having two. And then you have, and then I've had a whole bottle of wine and I'm like, this wasn't the plan for tonight. But like everyone's just, it's so hard for people to kind of separate what feels good for themselves because everyone just gets so caught up when they like hang out together and like, lives are stressful work is stressful I don't think it's unusual to be feeling the way that you're feeling but I think this step is going to be really exciting yes no I'm looking forward to it I'm already feeling better having made that decision and I was saying to Jordy this morning I downloaded this sober app and it's so cute it gives me like little notifications but there I feel like there are like privacy things wrong with this app like just this notification from an app that literally says I am sober pledge your sobriety <laughs> today and I'm like this is so full on if I was I don't know like trying to hide the, like if I was trying to ki- keep this private from people in my yeah. life or something it's so funny but yeah no I'm actually really enjoying the sobriety app the app is literally called I am sober and it tells you how many days you've been sober and you like pledge every morning I will stay sober and then at the end of the day it notifies you to like check in you share your mood what you did that day and then 
and you kind of do a little journal entry on like how you're feeling and stuff. So I'm just kind of in my wellness era. Yeah, it's really a transitional phase for you yeah. into like a full-on hippie <laughs> meditative moment. No, <laughs> never. That is the opposite of me. No, we literally all need to be meditating and going to therapy. That's my like attitude and I just feel like – Everyone talks about it a lot and it's like obviously a joke, you know, mm. that everyone needs to be in therapy but very few people that I know actually do. Mm. So this is like the pipeline for you yes. to actually be like the healthiest, most mentally well version of yourself, which like yes. I will need to follow. Yes. No, it's it's exciting. But then last night, so after our like – debauchery of our podcast and we debauchery were just, is that a word yeah I think debauchery I don't think I used it correctly but I think it's a word <laughs> debauchery no it's debauchery <laughs> is it not I don't know I don't know we'll let people judge the like chaos yes. of the podcast recording and the whole day and just freaking out got home like settled in on the couch to watch a, one of the shows that I'm going to talk about in a second so excited, whatever. And then Sean comes like barreling into the living room on the phone, holding a notepad. And he's like, did you go to Barry's boot camp on Wednesday morning? And I was like, I don't know. Like what? And he was like freaking out. And I was like, I don't know. No, I don't think so. And then I'm like looking through my phone and I'm like, no, I didn't go. Cause I did go on Friday, but I was like, no, I didn't go on Wednesday. Like I only went on Friday and he's like writing things down, whatever. And I can hear that there's this woman like talking really loudly on the phone to him. He hangs up and basically we are being framed for a hit and run. <laughs> Not, not of a, human, a person. Not of a person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was saying this is like a cultural difference, I think, between Canada and Australia, like language-wise, because we would use the term hit and run to describe you hitting a person and driving off or hitting a car and driving off. Yes. So I was talking about this on my Instagram stories last night and I had so many people messaging me being like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. That's so horrible. Thinking that I was talking about hitting a person. And then I had to clarify. And then a lot of my Canadian friends responded being like, no, 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 you can use it for that too. Like, I didn't think you hit a person. So I do feel like I have a little bit of like cushion there. No, but it was the funniest context because you're talking about how you don't remember if you did a hit and run. <laughs> and everyone's like, you don't remember if you hit a person? Yeah, true. <laughs> No. Okay. So here's what happened. The police called us and said, you have been reported as somebody who like hit a car in Surrey Hills and drove off. They're like, the car was a gray Mazda with like this license plate. And that was our car with our license plate. <laughs> and you're plate. like, this does sound like me. Yes. So immediately you're like, oh no, yes. I fucked up. I was like, I would be driving around Surrey Hills at 8 a.m. on a Wednesday near Barry's boot camp. Like that is me. And I would be scraping a car. Like that would also <laughs> be me. So I was like, what? What the fuck? And I'm like trying to figure out our location and I'm just freaking out being like, what was I doing at 8 a.m. on no, Wednesday? No, we literally looked at when the podcast was uploaded on YouTube last week. We were looking at Canva tile edits. Yes. We were looking at Google Doc edit times. Like yes. we were investigative journalists. No, we were. We were trying to figure out like, because I saw on my um in my camera roll that I had taken a gym selfie at 10 a.m. So I'm like, okay, I was at the gym in Zetland at 10 a.m. Mm. So what was I doing at 8 a.m. in Surrey yeah. Hills? Did you message our writer? <laughs> were you messaging me? Were you messaging in Slack? Like I was going back and like screenshotting yes. everything I could find. I was like, we will like save you. <laughs> Sean's like, this is a criminal investigation because the police are involved. And I was like, a criminal investigation? investigation for scraping someone's car like I was freaking out I was like I'm gonna get deported no you can't get deported <laughs> yeah no I cannot <laughs> it was so scary and so I I was based so I posted on my Instagram stories being like does anybody know how I can find my location I couldn't find it like there are different ways that iPhones have it but there's like this one major glitch I was like in the forums and there is like this very consistent glitch where the previous way you used to be able to see it like no longer works so point of the story is I didn't have any like good location services turned on. I couldn't figure it out. We found out that there is CCTV footage. So basically when the police called us, they were kind of like interrogating us. And then Sean was like, I don't think like it wasn't us. So then they're like, okay, if you're like denying this, we usually give people the opportunity to say like, oh yes, that was me. Yeah. And then you guys can just like work it out with insurance. Um, but they're like, if you're denying this, then this opens like in theory, an investigation. So they're like, well, look at the CCTV footage because apparently there is that. But this man is basically saying, yeah, that he saw me or like not me, but our <laughs> car <laughs> would have been me though. Um, scraping past this car in Surrey Hills on this like very specific intersection. And they gave us the intersection name. So then I looked back in my uh, Google Maps history mm -hmm. and I had parked at that intersection when I went to Barry's, like literally right where he's saying it happened 
on Friday, when I went to Barry's on Friday. And then we realized too, it's kind of weird that this man reported this with all of this information like a full week later. Yeah, he yeah, had yeah. all the information. So what we think happened, and like we still have no idea, so I'll keep you guys posted. So you're literally along for the journey like yeah. firsthand. Yeah. What we think happened is... Uh, like a gray Mazda scraped his car on Wednesday morning, like he's saying, but he didn't get the license plate or any other information. And then when I pulled up in my gray Mazda that was scraped all along the side on Friday and like parked. Unrelated. Scrape. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's something I scraped when we lived in Randwick like years ago and we just never got it fixed. So, but like I did that. That's why I was like, I, I would have done this. Like if this was me, it was me. But yeah, so then I parked in this exact spot that essentially like is in front of his house. And I think he probably saw my car parked there for a few hours and thought, oh my God, that must be the car because mm. it just like matches every other description, took down the license plate and then literally the next business day reported it. Like, On the that, Monday. Yeah, so like that mm. would actually be what makes sense. Way more plausible. Because like I was not in Surrey Hills on 8 a.m. on Wednesday. No, it's so like gaslighty yeah. like you fully thought you were insane for yes. a minute you were like I just cannot remember what I was doing and this is what we we're having the conversation this morning if it's a normal day and your routine isn't you know that far out of what you would normally do it's not actually that unusual that you don't remember what your day looked like. Totally. Like that you don't remember an hour by hour breakdown of your day. We were like, okay, well, we went to a premiere on the Tuesday night. So mm. we had a late start on the Wednesday. Yeah. So that meant that you would have gone to the gym later. So like putting yeah. the pieces together backwards, it's actually not unusual that you don't remember. Like people yeah. think that that would be like, what do you mean you don't remember what you were doing last Wednesday? Why would I remember that? My brain isn't full with that. My brain is full with other stuff. <laughs> exactly. Stressful stuff. <laughs> Internet culture things. Yeah. Literally. No, yeah. So basically I'm in my also like criminal era. <laughs> <laughs> You're sober criminal era. Oh my God. Yeah, literally. <laughs> no. So yeah, I don't know. I, I'll let you guys know. They're like, because obviously this is literally the lowest stakes, like police investigation ever. They're like, we'll call you back at some point this week. <laughs> I literally am so happy for Australia. This is what the cops are spending their time doing. Oh my God. Literally. Like. That's so true. No, but Delaney was like, I mean, on the day when there was a literal shooting in Bondi Junction, oh, yeah, yeah, they're not focusing on this man's scraped car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it's okay, buddy. No. So what I consumed, however, after <laughs> like all of that. So I've been watching And Just Like That, which is obviously the worst show ever. But like, it's a comfort show. It's very cute to see all the characters back together. Except the one unhinged plot line that I just don't think I'm going to be able to get over and like suspend my disbelief enough. Carrie has this podcast mm -hmm. and then she gets really weird about having to read out one of these ads that her network has put forward. It's for... I think like a vibrator, like something to do with your like vagina. And she just like won't say the word vagina or like vaginal or whatever. And she's freaking out and she spends like days trying to like rewrite this copy as a writer, which is hilarious that it would take her that long to rewrite this copy so she doesn't have to say these words she doesn't want to say, which is, first of all, so unhinged that she's a sex writer. She's supposed to be like the sex and relationship expert and she won't say the word vagina. Makes no sense. And then she walks into work at the end of season two, her and her producer, I guess. They walk in because they're like sleeping together. So they walk in together and everybody's like packing up boxes and the office is being taken down and they're like, well, advertisers pay the bills and, you know, you didn't say this ad. So our whole company has folded. <laughs> That literally makes no sense. I can't. I like it's really just giving millennial as a boss that doesn't want to have the confronting conversation of telling the <laughs> podcaster, you have to record your ad today. It's part of your job. It's literally. how you get paid. It's in your contract. Yeah. Fucking grow up. Yeah. And say the word. There's so many things wrong with it. It's like you would have a net pay period. You wouldn't be relying on that one ad to fund your business from the next day. Like that rent makes, in New York City too. Yeah. That makes no sense. That one ad wouldn't be like your whole business wouldn't be hinging on that one ad ad oh my god it's all so dumb also Carrie and the producer and like all these people wouldn't be 
like not told that their podcast was canceled and that the whole network went under. Like it was all just so dumb. So I'm not sure if I'm ever going to be able to get over that, but that's what's really pissing me off about that show. Will you be watching it next week? I will. But are they, are they wake to wake releases at the moment? I think so. Yeah, I think it is. Um, and then I also have been watching Kim Cattrall's new show called Glamorous on Netflix, which is so shady because it dropped the same day as, and just like that, that which her. is so funny. It's so good. It is I mean, it's also really bad. I was comparing it to Emily in Paris. Like, it's really glitzy and glamoury, except instead of fashion, like, Emily in Paris really kind of builds out. It's all about the makeup because the whole point is that it's this aspiring beauty YouTuber named Marco, and he's, like, 23 years old, and he gets a job as the personal assistant to this woman named Madeline, who was this, like, world-famous, like, top model in her day, and now she's owned this beauty empire, Glamorous by Madeline, this makeup company company for decades now. And there's just so many things that are so relevant to what I like and what I'm interested in. Like Mm. obviously beauty YouTubers, aspiring influencers, like makeup company. And then the makeup company is also kind of not doing well. And so they're trying to navigate this acquisition. So there's like business tings Mm. in it. It's so good. New York city. Like it's honestly (laughs) so good. But it's also so bad. Like, the script is really, really bad. So Kim Cattrall is Madeline? Yes. Yeah, okay. Main yeah. character. Yeah, it's so cute. So it's a good, like, cruisy watch. And it's a good, like, counter watch then and just like that. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, so that's basically been my week. It's okay. been eventful. I want to watch Glamorous. That sounds so fun. I think you would like it. Like, it's, yeah. Also, I loved Emily in Paris. Like, I know people yeah. are just, that's just so lowbrow to like Emily in Paris, but it's so kitschy mm-hmm. and non-stressful mm-hmm. and beautiful, you know. Like, it's so easy to lose yourself in something like that. So I totally. feel like, yeah, this is the vibe. Yeah, Glamorous is very camp. Like, you just have to go into it knowing. Yes. It's very over the top and nothing makes sense, but it's like fun. And you know, I don't like to watch hard things. So (laughs) this feels like it's right up my alley. Yes. Okay. So how was your week? Okay. Well, compounding Lauren's criminal offense last night that she's being (laughs) framed for. Yes. Uh, our run around the world today to find the new version of the cord that was broken from yesterday. <laughs> Taylor Swift tickets oh, obviously yes. also went on tour, at, um, went on sale. Sorry, at 10 a.m. today. So we had a meeting at nine uh, with a client. And my mom and my two sisters were all trying to get tickets for the four of us. So I think the four of us were going to try and go together. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm the only one. I can't Mm. be in the green room or, you know, Mm. like waiting for tickets. It's just a bad morning. And at 9.55 in the meeting, my phone just started absolutely fucking blowing up. But I have good news to report we got four tickets for Friday night. Yay! So everything is right with the world after the most stressful like 24 so hours. So good. So I actually have seen Lauren and I were just scrolling through a bunch of like our friends, listeners, like friends of the brand have all seemed to get tickets. There's yeah. been a lot of like news stories reported that no one knows anyone that got tickets. I did, did take around an hour and a half. I don't think anyone, if they opened at 10, I don't think anyone really started getting through until like 11.15-ish. Uh, but everyone that we know that was trying and that we've spoken to about it has gotten tickets. So, so exciting. I'm going on Friday. Lauren's going on Sunday. We are in our genuine eras moment. (laughs) Our genuine eras era. We need to stop saying era. Um, But yeah, that was really fun. And as far as content that I've consumed, mixing it up a little bit this week because I haven't watched much, but I do have two newsletter recommendations. So the first is one called Engine Failure by a writer called Lily Herman. And they're monthly, but they're essentially like an F1 culture newsletter. So it's my perfect crossover because, you know, every now and again, I like a little bit of technical Mm -hmm. info about the cars but that's not really my vibe Mm -hmm. so Lily Herman really covers everything from like Daniel Ricciardo's attempt to become a mainstream celebrity to solidify his career outside of F1 to like Lewis Hamilton's relationship with celebrity stylist Law Roach who we kind of spoke about a couple of weeks ago he's like working with Zendaya now but he had this massive kind of moment where he removed himself from the fashion industry but this edition was super interesting and something that I find like personally so fascinating 
she explores the question of if it matters if F1 drivers are sexualized. So she explores kind of how it's typically used to like gatekeep traditional fans from the sport, like the drive to survive fans, the new era. They're like, you only care about the sport because the drivers are hot. Mm. Like, yes, that is definitely a component. But Mm -hmm. she's like, does this matter? It's all consensual. They're posting their own, you know, shirtless pics on Instagram. Like hot people are always associated with like big commercial developments and making more money. Men also want their sports heroes to be attractive, even if they won't say it. They just don't know how to. Also, F1, like obviously is a unique sport in the sense that it's very small. Mm. But like the hottest players on every type of sports team or organization always become the most famous. Like David Beckham. Completely. And like the whole sport is associated with luxury consumer goods, Mm. right? Like Rolex and Mm. Richard Mille and like these watch brands. Like Ferrari even has the ties to fashion. So the fact that these drivers are hot is like literally unsurprising if you have like one critical thought about it because like that is the nature that's why it's been so successful that's why it makes so much money so it's a really really good read it's about 15,000 words so it is a genuine dissertation but I like absolutely devoured it so love that we'll put the link in the show notes to sign off if if anyone would like to join that list and then Amy O'Dell's newsletter back row and she wrote uh Anna Anna Wintour's biography that Lauren and I both loved But she wrote a piece recently in her Substack where she talks about how Pharrell's debut for creative as creative director for Louis Vuitton menswear is the equivalent of a Marvel movie, which I loved because obviously a Marvel girly. Mm. But she really spoke about how it's not about high fashion anymore. Pharrell just made the show as big as physically possible so it can actually exist outside of the realm of critique, which is fashion is obviously very gatekeepy as well. It's a highly critiqued industry. And I think Pharrell has taken quite a unique approach in just unabashedly, like unashamedly inviting every single celebrity that he can, making it the biggest, like bigger than Ben-Hur moment. And everyone is so enamored by the whole event that like you sell bags by default because everyone is fucking talking about the show. But also like any criticism is kind of irrelevant because people don't care. They just love the spectacle of it. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting too. And then as far as the actual content that I watched, I watched Secret Invasion, which is the latest limited series from Marvel. Um, there's only one episode that's come out and I've watched that. I'm really unsure how I feel about it yet, but it's headed up by Olivia Coleman, Samuel L. Jackson and Amelia Clark, which is very mm. cool to bring some new, very mainstream names into the game. And from what I've seen, people are just excited about how much good actors like can carry and change the direction of a show. And that's not something Marvel's like really known for, right, Mm -hmm. is the quality of acting. So there's a lot of potential, not entirely sold yet, but we will see as more episodes come out. So, yeah, that has been my week. We've also had a few amazing reviews. So we're going to read a few of them out. The first is from Venata from Canada. She said, a slice of sanity. This podcast is so enjoyable, such a pleasure. The fun topics are great, but it's the heavier topics that really give my brain some peace and rest. Please keep up the great work. Your genuine research and reporting is so important. With the way the world is, pure escapism doesn't actually feel fun and light anymore. It feels much more light and uplifting to listen to a pod like this that acknowledges reality. I walk away from... This pod feeling validated, grounded and uplifted, which is such a gift when most media these days makes it feel like I'm drowning in chaos and being deliberately gaslit. Brackets normal if you also feel that way because so much of global and local media is deliberately lying and trying very hard to gaslight slash manipulate society. Lauren and Jordan create a chill, easy listening pod without sacrificing critical thinking and that's what makes this such a special and enjoyable podcast. Seriously, please keep up the great work. Slices of sanity like this are basically all that's standing between society and a global corporate dictatorship. We are making an impact, guys. Venata is giving us way too much credit, but thank you so much for the kind words. And like the longest review ever, honestly, the best read. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is like, honestly, that's what we try and do is stimulate some Mm -hmm. critical thought. So it's nice to know that that is translating. But yeah, this is incredible yeah this is the sweetest to thing ever feedback. like truly we are out here curing capitalism yeah this is now a podcast <laughs> this is an exclusively political podcast yeah. about the new economic system for the world <laughs> <laughs> okay the next review is from hayden in the u.s 
Hayden says, this pod is everything. I absolutely love this podcast. These girls know their stuff and make viral news so much fun, even when it's depressing. Lol, keep shining. <laughs> Disco ball, white love heart. That's kind of the through line. Like we make depressing things sound not so depressing because we acknowledge that they're depressing. <laughs> yes. And then like never have any answers. So we kind of just have to laugh through it. Yeah, literally. Thank you for being here, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then a Spotify review from Hannah. Hannah said, another fascinating app that got me and Dash through a very rainy vet trip. I know Mm. it's serious content, but I think it's absolutely vital we talk about this trend and how damaging it is to everyone. Thanks, Bestie Hannah and Dash, our mascot. Our mascot. So So cute. Okay, and then we had some TikTok comments, and we get like a bunch of TikTok comments, but these ones we thought were just so cute. So Tess said, new fave podcast. I am obsessed. Just listened to your podcast for the first time this morning, and I'm hooked. Love all your takes so much. Love it. And then Material Girl (laughs) responded to that and said, glad I'm not the only one. I absolutely adore y'all and can't wait for more. Crazy how I had the exact same experience this morning, lol. God, so good. So TikTok good. is like most of the time so evil. So evil. <laughs> I do think our podcast is growing a lot because of TikTok, yeah. but it's also a very scary place. Yeah, it is. You just have to like post and not look again generally yes. is how we keep our like sanity intact. Yeah. Um, and then we had some amazing news on Friday night. A longtime listener and also Aussie media friend, Laura Messia. So she is the entertainment editor for Pedestrian TV. And she actually included us in Pedestrian's 30 Best Podcast Roundup. And we were number two. Number two, baby, in the world. So of every podcast. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, turn your voices down. Literally <laughs> shut up. We don't need this whole segment every single week where all you do is talk about how great you are. <laughs> This was also kind of one of our first pieces of what feels like coverage because it is a really interesting space just for a little bit of context that we are a media brand. So it's also kind of hard for other media brands to cover us because it is quite competitive in the landscape. So it just feels so nice to get validation from another youth publisher as well and somebody that like you know a publication that we look up to we've actually spoken a lot with Chris the co-founder of Pedestrian he's been like kind of mental vibes for us so yeah it's full circle moment yes but Laura writes if you want to be down with the kids and understand what chronically online shit your little cousin is talking about you've got to listen to Infinite Scroll lovable hosts Lauren Meisner and Jordan Christensen are one of the only reasons my 27 year old ass knows what the fuck about the drama happening between 16 year old dancing tiktokers but more importantly their incredibly thorough research and insightful opinions are both fascinating and entertaining honestly thank you so much getting legitimate press is just a dream yeah and reviews like the reviews that are coming in at the moment are also awesome so thank you everyone so much for your feedback it's been amazing and so helpful for us yes okay without further ado On to viral news. Okay, so the first piece of viral news that I'm sure you have seen, but a bunch of TikTok influencers are facing intense backlash for attending a Xi'an brand trip to China. So it all kicked off when creators started sharing their experiences from a recent Xi'an-sponsored trip to China with the attendees speaking positively of their experience and the brand. Many users believe that the trip was a relatively transparent attempt by Sheehan to address the damaging narrative around the company. So the influences in attendance included AJ Butler, Destiny and Brandon, Fernanda Stefani Campuzan. Probably. Campuzan. Kenya Freeman and Mariana Saavedra. And Danny DMC. Over the course of four days, the creators visited a Sheehan factory in Guangzhou and the company's, quote, innovation center. All while speaking with several managers, employees, and factory workers. The attendees seemingly had a similar perception of the brand, with many impressed by Shein's high tech infrastructure and the employees' working environment. So, AJ posted a series of vlogs during the trip and addressed the allegations around the brand in her captions. It's also crazy that they're going on this trip to try and like drum up positive press, but they have to immediately address the fact that they're there to drum up positive press. Yeah. Like that must be a very stressful situation, like going into this trip. Yeah. So she said, I spoke to many workers as well as other staff employees on many issues the company has been facing over the past few years. They have declined many of the allegations that have been put forth and are aiming to open up more to share their side. Going to the facility really surprised me. They get thousands and thousands of orders daily from people around the world, but mainly in the United States. And over the past few years, they were able to create a system with high technology and workers that meet the daily demand they need to fulfill. 
So the influencer accounts from the trip stand in stark contrast with the findings from multiple public investigations into the company's policies and practices, many of which claim that the employees are both underpaid and overworked. So I feel like we all know this. We all know the bad vibes around Sheen. It's kind of people shop from Sheen, but they don't tell anyone they shop from Sheen. Yeah. But according to Swiss Advocacy Guru, Public Eye, factory employees, mostly migrants, work up to 75 hours a week, often working multiple shifts daily. Another Another investigation by UK broadcaster Channel 4 found that employees in two different factories worked up to 18-hour days with some only paid the equivalent of four cents for each clothing item. So users have questioned whether the creators on the trip actually saw legitimate working Shein factories and a Twitter user at Susan Cashmere with a history in fashion manufacturing created a thread explaining why the influencers likely visited a staged factory. So Susan said, first tip off is the lack of safety signage everywhere. Where are the fire escape signs, the first aid signs, the fire extinguishers? Fashion creates a lot of dust and dust is flammable. Where are the garments on all these machines? Can they afford to have all this state of the art manufacturing equipment and no manufacturing? Fast fashion means these machines need to be full to pay for them. Others think this could be a sample factory. So after days of backlash, Danny also took to TikTok in a now deleted video and addressed the criticism around the trip, doubling down on her positive messaging about the brand. She said, I was not paid for any trip or to say anything. I was taken on the trip a once in a lifetime chance. You would have done the exact same thing. I have so much more awareness of what is going on behind the scenes than any of you could ever, than any of you ever could because you don't see what is going on. If you think it is propaganda, up, that's cool. Again, you have never been to China and you have never seen what is going on. <laughs> okay, Danny. Literally, like millions of people saw that video. I'm sure some of them have been to China. <laughs> it's just such a sweeping statement. <laughs> Also, just because you went to China doesn't mean that you know everything about like the ins and outs of this fashion brand either. They're not like mutually exclusive. (laughs) Um, So beyond potential contractual obligations to the company, many users suggested that the reason these creators are so quick to defend Shein may be due to the lack of opportunities afforded to minority creators, making these groups more likely to support controversial brands like Shein. So a Twitter user at Ortega Uwagba writes, not a defense of these influencers at all, but can't help but notice the group is very diverse, plus size slash black, etc. Makes me think these influencers are those who, as we know, don't get as many brand opportunities and therefore are more willing slash grateful to work with whoever. And then another Twitter user, Che Adria, had a similar take, sharing that she and chose women that they thought would be desperate enough for the perks. Notice there are no thin white women here. It's non-verbal messaging that this shit is beneath them, but they called in women that they don't think are. Yeah, so like we said, Danny has deleted her double down and AJ deleted her Instagram reel that we read from where she was basically saying like, I was really surprised to hear how well the employees are treated and how much technology and infrastructure they have. And I think that is what Sheehan was hoping this trip would provide the public was like they were basically using influencers obviously as PR tool to kind of debunk all of these like exposés and like the research that's been done on how unethical their company is. Um, They were using them as kind of like talking figureheads. However, I think that the messaging that they were trying to possibly covertly share through these influencers was that it's actually not sweatshop workers that are, you know, making our clothes. It's actually all of this technology. Like it's all this technology and infrastructure and like these robots that are making all of our clothes guys. Like nobody is being exploited. They also know that it's not plausible for it to be a normal looking factory because of the output. So there had to be some element Mm. that was, you know, unusual or like extremely progressive to match how much clothing and how cheaply Shane actually sells it for. Well, yeah. And that's the thing is like the through line that everyone on the trip seems to have taken away and was like pushing to their audiences was like, Shein is using this like advanced technology (laughs) and it don't worry. They're not using sweatshop workers. Like this is not a sweatshop. And instead it looks like an actual designer atelier in like (laughs) Paris. It was so like creepy and like eerie and I don't know I just I agree with the perspectives that 
Sheehan chose certain influencers who maybe don't get as many opportunities as other influencers. And like some of these girls have like a million followers. Well, and it is a quite a good alignment for lack of a better term, because that is always a part of the conversation with Sheehan is that, you know, traditional or sustainable brands mm-hmm. don't necessarily make a full range of clothing sizes. Yes, yeah. So it kind of made sense for them to work, like kind of move in that direction mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting strategy that Sham would even take the approach of like so overtly trying to debunk like actual investigative claims. I know. Like, cause it's just drawing more attention to the fact that people don't believe them, yeah. like that it's kind of all been falsified. Just take the girls on a brand trip to like the Maldives and have like a vacation. Like I just, I don't understand. They've dug their own grave with this one because it's been such a PR miss. Yeah, I agree. Despite trying to show like this transparency. And I saw someone on Twitter say, if they really wanted to debunk these claims against them and be transparent, then they should have brought investigative journalists. But they brought influencers who are contractually obligated to say nice things about them because they're being paid probably. Yeah, and if they have no, if they can afford to take influences on a trip of this scale maybe you should look at improving the circumstances within your actual company yes. as well like that would be better PR be like okay we could have done this but instead we're reinvesting that money back into improving the working conditions mm-hmm. of our actual sweatshops the whole thing is just I but just, then they would have to admit that the that they have sweatshops and that they are as unethical as people say and clearly their whole brand strategy, their whole PR strategy is to deny. Deny, deny, deny. <laughs> yeah, like they are going to take no culpability. And I guess the only thing I will say is that in Danny's video, which we said she has since deleted, but she says at the end, like for all of you guys coming for me and all the other girls that went on this trip, like if you look in your closet, 90% of that stuff was made in a sweatshop. And that is honestly valid. Like, yeah. you know, we're sitting here criticizing them wearing Zara let's say you know and it's like that's not any better well it's been marketed differently but it's a very similar concept right like and that's part of Shane's marketing it was just so kind of shoddy at the Mm -hmm. beginning that I feel like that was a bad move that they maybe will never be able to come back from now but I mean, at the end of the day, it's also probably better that people understand what Shein is versus a Zara, thinking that Zara is any better. True, actually. But I feel like Shein also, it's not going to stop people from buying it. I feel like people will know that it's bad. They just buy it and don't tell anyone. Because it's cheap. Yeah. Okay. Uh, speaking about other influencers that lie, <laughs> Mr. Beast has lied, question mark, about almost being on the Ocean Gate submarine. So on Sunday, Mr. Beast tweeted that he was almost on the Ocean Gate submarine that presumably imploded en route to explore the Titanic wreckage. He included a screenshot of a text message that seemingly invited him on the submarine. So in the tweet, he wrote, I was invited earlier this month to ride the Titanic submarine. I said no. Kind of scary that I could have been on it. And then the screenshot of this text message says... Also, I'm going on the Titanic in a submarine late this month. The team would be stoked to have you along. So users were quick to note that something was off about the text that he posted. It was an iMessage in a blue bubble. And anyone that has an iPhone knows that messages you send are blue and ones you receive are gray. So this means the message he screenshotted was a message that he sent to himself? (laughs) Question mark? Mr. Beast, do you think we're all idiots? So after hours of people making fun of him, Mr. Beast tweeted that his friend had sent him a screenshot of the message that his friend had sent to him. So he wrote, my friend sent me the screenshot of when he invited me. Didn't think to scroll up and screenshot our old text myself. And I mean, he hasn't deleted it because I think it's too embarrassing to because it like shows that you actually just like fucked this up. But what I've seen a lot of people say is that um, right after 9-11, there was a lot of celebrities, like mainstream celebrities that came out and would say things like, I almost flew on 9-11 or I almost, you know, flew into New York or left New York on 9-11. And so people are saying that this is like internet celebrities version. This is a 2023 version of of that. that. Yeah. It's just gross. I really just think like tying yourself to this tragedy for the sake of clout is just completely yuck. It's super disrespectful. Like you weren't on it, so it's fine. Like you can tell the people close to you if this is true, but I think making it public, but then also it's incredibly on brand for him. Well, that's the thing is like, even if it is true, and even if this whole story about his friend sending him the message and that's the one that he tweeted, like whatever, 
why are you saying this? Like, yeah. it's literally not about you. Yeah, it's not about you. And, like, there are people in mourning over this. And, mm. you know, it was such a dire situation that, like, this is not productive Con- this is not a productive contribution to the discourse either. Yeah, like, like, but you weren't on it, okay? <laughs> yeah, you were also like the whole premise of the sub of the submersible going missing that everyone is kind of divided on is like the billionaire of it all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people hate billionaires. It's like you also would have fit into that group of billionaires that people like are hating on. And yeah. yes, you're an internet star, so it's kind of different. But I just think it's all it hits too close to home and it's completely irrelevant at the same time. Yeah, totally. And then like, did his friend go? Is his friend at the bottom of the ocean? Oh, we, I'm he really confused. He would have posted about that exactly. because that would have been even more of a relevant tie. He's literally yeah. just reaching. This man yeah, is Yeah, because this is not true. Unwell. This is a message he sent to himself. Embarrassing. 100%. <laughs> We were saying that, like, next week, his next video is going to be, like... It's going to be, like, a challenge to escape the submersible (laughs) and whoever, like, wins. Gets, like, 250 grand in honor of how much it costs. Yeah, it's going to be something completely unhinged and completely disrespectful. And, like, dystopian. Yes, it's the most dystopian thing. Mr. Beast is bringing to life everyone's, like, dystopian nightmares. 100%. But it's all, like, glittery and glam and people don't realize what they're actually watching or being exposed to. It's but it's under the guise of like charity. Yeah. He's honestly a mastermind. Yeah, How he has is. he done this? How has he tricked everyone? <laughs> Okay, the next story is honestly like the story that we all wanted or maybe just you and I over the last few weeks. Back to our OG TikTok roots. So Josh Richards allegedly has a new girlfriend. So the TikToker turned podcaster looks to be dating Brazilian content creator Gabrielle Mora. So Gabby has over 9 million TikTok followers and 1.5 million on Instagram. She mostly posts dancing and lip syncing videos. Again, back to our OG TikTok days. Mm -hmm. But the two sparked relationship rumors back in April 2020 23 after Josh started posting videos of the pair getting cozy from lip syncing to various audios to hanging out together with their friends internet users were quick to speculate about their status as a couple so Gabby and Josh even recreated a video he made with Mads with Mads Lewis who Josh has been romantically linked to in the past and while Josh has previously admitted that he has hooked up with Mads the pair are known for kind of stirring the pot when it comes to the nature of their relationship but these rumors have intensified when Gabby and Josh attended the red carpet premiere of my favorite movie Spider-Man Across the (laughs) Spider-Verse together last month and then Bryce Hall who we also haven't spoken about in one million years later added to the speculation when he posted a picture of the pair to his Snapchat story writing Josh finally made it official with an engagement ring (laughs) as the caption. And then when BFF's podcast host Dave Portnoy asked Josh about the Snapchat, he clarified that the couple is not yet official and that he still has to ask Gabby. Things seem to be getting more serious with Josh allegedly throwing Gabby a surprise party for her birthday this week. Cute. So we love that for them. I feel like this is like, uh, this is Josh's kind of first, is this his first girlfriend? Possibly real girlfriend. He's been linked to NASA? so many girls too yeah. since. And we've kind of covered all of them and then none of them have gone anywhere. Yeah, yeah. But I am surprised that he has kind of chosen or ended up with, if this, you know, comes to fruition, another TikToker. I just thought he's mm. really in his like businessman, Dave Portnoy pro- protege mm. era. And I honestly thought he would kind of be branching out of TikTok a little bit. But I think that shows that he actually just like can't. Like he had a lot of promise, mm. but he actually never became like the entrepreneur that he was on track to become. That we all hoped he would be. Yes. Yeah. He really was kind of this beacon of like diversification and like a business growth from TikTok. Mm-hmm. TikTok kid to like, he ended up being a consultant on like a Gen Z production company with Mark Wahlberg. Like there were all these huge mm. rumors swirling and then he's ended up like literally just going from like TikTok at a podcast host. Yeah, yeah. So like, I don't know, like it's fine. He's yeah. fine. He's just chilling. Yeah, he's cute. Okay, so the next story is that Selena Gomez has unfollowed several major celebrities on Instagram, sparking questions about her rumored romance with Zayn Malik. So over the weekend, fans noticed that Selena unfollowed some major A-listers, 
including Gigi Hadid, Bella Hadid, Dua Lipa, and Zendaya. Most interestingly, however, she also seemingly unfollowed Zayn Malik, putting an end to the dating rumors. So in case you missed it, Selena and Zayn were seen kissing in New York City on March 23rd. A source to- told Entertainment Tonight at the time, Selena and Zayn went out in Soho in New York last night around 10.30 p.m. They walked in holding hands and were kissing. Most restaurant staff and restaurant goers didn't notice them. It seemed like they were comfortable together and it was clear they were on a date. However, they were never spotted together again and they were never publicly photographed together. And Selena has spent the last two months in Paris kind of like by herself. And in early June, she also said on TikTok that she was single. So I would say that they are definitely not a thing. And that could have been like an actual lie. Or, you know, it was like a literal hookup. Like that's what everyone was saying about Taylor Swift and Maddie Healy, right? Like Mm. relax. They don't have to be boyfriend and girlfriend. They probably just like hooked up once or twice. Mm -hmm. Like they're kind of allowed to do that without it being like some existential crisis for everyone that they're together. So Mm. I genuinely like my opinion is that they maybe just like hooked up once or twice and then parted ways. But I did see a tweet in response to this news that she'd unfollowed Zane, Gigi, Bella and Dua and someone said – For someone that's about to turn 31 years old, she's truly the most toxic and childish one out of all her peers, knows nothing about acting her age. And somebody replied to that and said, are you okay? It's an unfollow on Insta. (laughs) But I don't think it's just an unfollow on Insta. I think it really speaks to a pattern of behavior with Selena. And we saw this with Hayley, how she kind of weaponized her fans. Like she knows the power that she has. Yeah. And she can't unfollow somebody publicly without it becoming a story or without it kind of stirring up or sparking some drama. Like she really could just mute them. Yes. I think when you're an A-list celeb, if you decide to unfollow people, you are aware that that is going to be taken in a certain way. Yeah. Like it's making a statement. Yes, it is. And now we need to know what the beef is. Yes. I need to know. We are like, we're the perfect audience for (laughs) Selena to stir up drama. Like I'm, it's just, it's so confusing to me why she would do something like this so publicly when she's probably never going to actually reveal the reason. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, And then the last little thing I wanted to cover before we get into our main topic, just because I've seen it everywhere recently, but we covered Alex Earl Braxton. I was going to say what's his name, Brandon? Braxton Berrios, whatever his name is. No, I think it's Braxton. Yeah, and Sophia Culpo and that whole like love triangle in an episode months ago now. And Sophia has been out here on TikTok like liking and commenting on videos basically confirming that Braxton cheated on her with Alex Earl. Yeah. So it has really, you know, reinvigorated the conversation and debate about the standards of it all and that interesting love triangle. But yeah, rewind a little bit if you are interested in uh, a breakdown of it. But it seems like it's the truth. Okay, guys. So off the back of a listener request and another unfortunate episode about scammers slash grifters, we were actually going to talk about this person last week as part of the kind of anti-woke influencers conversation and then decided, A, it wasn't quite the right fit and B, she needed her own episode. <laughs> yeah, she did. We were, well, because our episode was going to be more so about like grifters online, like yeah. influencer grifters. And then when it veered towards like the political <laughs> <laughs> populism breakdown. Yeah. Of like anti-woke and all of that. It just did not make sense because she does not fit into that category at all. No, but this week we are going to be talking about Caroline Calloway. So we're going to be bringing you a very important deep dive into the influencer and author. And like we said, this episode was inspired by partly a listener's request, but also partly by the renewed discourse about Caroline as she recently released a self-published memoir, which has taken the internet by storm. So we'll first break down who she is and why she's internet famous before exploring her relationship with writer Natalie Beach, a relationship that catapulted Caroline's name into the mainstream for better or for worse. And then we'll finish by talking about the reviews of her book and what fans think is next for her. So... Who is Caroline Calloway? (laughs) Also want to preface by saying this will make more sense as we go along, but there is no factual linear storyline about Caroline's like Mm. life, especially life on the internet, because 
she's a liar. Yes. Yeah. Like that's the thing is doing research for this. I pulled from so many different articles uh, and they all had different things to say. They were somewhat similar, Mm. but their dates were possibly wrong or like just details here and there were different about Caroline's upbringing or her Mm. time at Cambridge, like whatever it was. So I went mostly off of the most recent stuff I could find Mm -hmm. So, because I'm assuming that's what she's now telling journalists and also her Wikipedia. So this is like the best I could do. Yeah. <laughs> so Caroline Calloway is a 31-year-old Instagram influencer and also kind of a low-key Nepo baby. So she was born in Falls Church, Virginia and attended the very prestigious boarding school Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. Caroline's great, great, great grandfather was a North Carolina state senator and her great grandfather was Owen Burns, a real estate mogul who developed many of the historic buildings in Sarasota, Florida. And her father was an alumni of Exeter, which is how she got in because he was kind of this like child genius. So he got into Exeter despite being from a really poor farming family. And then he graduated from Harvard. I think she was saying by the age of 20, he was kind of this like genius, but also plagued by mental illness. So when Caroline was 17, she changed her last name from Calloway Gotchel to Gotchel Calloway because she thought it would, quote, look better on books. She has wanted to be an author for a very long time. A famous author. A famous author. Fame is crucial element. But she also has wanted to be a memoirist specifically. (laughs) Like that's what she actually wants to be writing about. She does not have like fairy tales or fiction or whatever. She doesn't want to write about anything else except for her own life. So Caroline went to NYU where she met her frenemy, Natalie Veach. They were both in a prestigious writing program and became fast friends because according to Natalie, Caroline was obsessed with Yale, but didn't get in and never got over it. So Caroline loved that Natalie grew up in New Haven and was a Yale townie. And more on Natalie in a little bit. But Caroline left NYU to attend Cambridge University because, quote, she always claimed she couldn't bear to go through life with an NYU alumni email address. (laughs) I just love how she has access to, I would say not even, some things she has access to are not even upper middle class, like they're upper class. Mm. But she needs to be in the 1%. Like, she needs the old money energy. Yeah. That's all she cares about. Yeah, like, NYU is so prestigious for specific programs, one of them being writing. And she's like, nope, not good enough. She literally went to Exeter, which is, like, one of the most prestigious boarding schools in the world. And she's like, mm... I cannot die with an NYU email address. Like, that's too embarrassing. I love it. She's like, it's too pavo for me. It's so brazen. She's like the most brazen person I've ever heard of in my whole life. Yes. So it was at Cambridge that Caroline's influencing career really took off. And she actually later admitted to Photoshopping her transcript to get into Cambridge. She wrote in her book, Scammer, quote, that class was at the same time Andy had a free period, which he liked to fuck me in his top bench. I began by photo- top bench, <laughs> top bed. <laughs> I began by photoshopping my Exeter transcript. Was this difficult with their complex visual watermark? Yes, but I'm an art historian and artist. Okay, and- both of them. That's like lie A, lie B, <laughs> and then she's admitted overall that she photoshopped her transcript but this was also off the back of like what you just said she was obsessed with being in this one percent apparently she's obsessed with ivies Mm -hmm. didn't get into yale Mm -hmm. or harvard or any of the other ivies in the u.s Mm -hmm. and this was her third application to cambridge and she only got in because she photoshopped her transcript so this is a good start yeah and andy i don't know if we're going to talk about him again i don't think we do but he is her boyfriend was her her high school boyfriend i believe yeah and he's i think uh, him and natalie are like the only two people in her book that she names with their real name and she was saying on a podcast i was listening to she's like hopefully i don't get sued by him (laughs) oh my god okay babe so funny okay so how slash why is caroline famous caroline launched her own influencer career very intentionally so she joined in Instagram in 2012 to document her university experience at Cambridge. She chose an Instagram handle. She bought 40,000 followers for $4.99. And she basically found an image of herself that she wanted to use, which had orchids in her hair. Hannah Gillett and Eric Olson write for varsity.co.uk, quote, Caroline's niche, strange now but compelling then, was the length of her captions. She felt like Americans when they watch Harry Potter and you could tell. The captions were sweet 
cute bordering on sickly. I also found out today listening to another mm. podcast on though, like we said, take everything with a grain of salt, that she would target mm -hmm. – her Instagram ads to fans of Harry Potter. Okay, yes, because that's another way that she grew. So she like inflated her followers, obviously, yes. to kind of start creating this FOMO effect. And then she paid for Instagram ads. Yes, to kind of reach the right audiences of what she said were Americans that were really obsessed <laughs> with this kind of gothic British uh, luxury lifestyle. Yeah. But it's also really interesting that, you know, buying followers and the fact she's admitted that now because she said early on in a lot of interviews that she posted a photo of macaroons and it ended up on the Explore page and went viral and that's how she got 40,000 followers. <laughs> and, like, to be fair, she was, like, a very early adopter. Yeah. So, like, as we know with TikTok and stuff, like, early adopters are – uh, rewarded, but yeah. like not to this extent. And I mean, has Caroline Calloway ever done a brand deal? Like, does it really matter if she bought her first 40,000 followers? Like she's really only ever monetized her audience. Yeah, completely. And it also wasn't that insane at the time. We didn't know what influencer marketing was yet. Like we didn't really know that it was unethical. Like if you mm -hmm. were trying to build a brand mm -hmm. and create a FOMO effect, like it does seem like a logical path if people like aren't talking about, you know, how you're exploiting your audience or lying yeah, you know, yeah. I, it, it did feel a bit different then than it would say if we were having this conversation now. Totally. So an example of one of her captions from April 7th, 2014, she wrote, Welcome to Cambridge, Instagram. It's time to party like it's Downton Abbey seasons one through four and ain't nothing, not even World War One or Lady Mary's attitude problem is going to rain on our Insta parade. Today begins an exciting new chapter of collegiate adventure sausage, one filled with Harry Potter-like castles, Jane Austen like balls and very mixed references to pop culture. In Scammer, she writes, I smartly doubled down on my own Americanism. I use the British British contempt for them as cover. She also did have a boyfriend while she was at Cambridge that was kind of her second significant boyfriend after Andy that there was a period where she was going to like galas yes. and balls all the time. Like she was very much living this life. She was posting a lot about, you know, this this 1% kind of activity um, and how luxurious it was and she really made it feel like this was – her genuine lifestyle like she'd be yeah. trying to create that and lean into that kind of imagery and then she found a way to like actually be that at the same time but the interesting thing about her is that she's this dichotomy where it's like she actually desperately wants to be in it but she also wants to exploit it for content mm. and to share that with the world what it's actually like to be inside of it whereas I feel like for the most part people that want to be in it respect that it is a completely private experience you do not talk about what happens when you are in the one percent you oh, know completely it's the same like I feel like these conversations are kind of coming back around now with the mm. old money aesthetic of it all being really popular it's like old money whispers new money screams mm. right it's like a very similar energy like if you were actually genuinely a part of that upper echelon yeah you don't talk about it that's so true yeah so she never really would feel like she belonged because it was always for like an ulterior motive but it but that's why she's a dichotomy because it was it was but it wasn't like she genuinely wanted to be in it it wasn't like mm. she was like a journalist going in weaseling like her undercover. way in yes to like actually expose this truth or like write about this world she kind of wanted to have it both ways and you literally just can't this is the beginning of how we are so confused about this person <laughs> I know. During her final year at Cambridge, Caroline hired Natalie Beach to co-write her memoir and book proposal. She then set up an initial meeting with literary agent Bird Livell, Livell? Yeah. by pretending to be his secretary that she was already his client. So Livell has since described his experience working with Caroline, quote, she was deeply unwell, deeply dishonest. It was more important to her to be seen as an author than it was to be an author. She didn't know how to be an author. And I do think that's the whole crux of Caroline Calloway. Like, whether you love her or you hate her, or you don't care about her, like the thing that's interesting about her is that all she really cares about, what motivates her in life is being famous and being famous for something intelligent or important or seen as like aristocratic. But isn't it so funny? And like, we'll obviously dive into this a little bit later, but wanting to be something specific that badly since you were 17 and then getting the opportunity and then just not doing it. 
Yeah, I know. Like, what the fuck? That's it was so all true. like it was all laid out in front of you. You could have had the life that you wanted. Like, I am confused. I think that's why people really believed Natalie's essay at first mm. because it. She basically said, "I wrote most of Caroline's content. She's a disaster. Yeah. Like, you don't know the real her." And so that's why I think initially when her essay came out, people believed it because it aligned with the fact that. Caroline couldn't produce anything. She yeah. really couldn't finish anything. Yeah, she had all these ambitions and then like nothing ever came of it. Yeah. In 2015, Caroline publicly announced that Flatiron Books had offered her a book deal to write a memoir, despite being like, what, 23 or something, mm. for $500,000. of USD. Which, yeah, USD, of which she received a 30% advance. However, by 2017, she withdrew from the book deal, citing that her publisher was being sexist by wanting her book to focus on relationships with men. She confessed to an Adderall addiction, and she later began selling creativity workshops to her followers for $165 that, as per the original announcement, indicated that the workshop would offer tutorials on building an Instagram brand, developing ideas, and addressing the, quote, emotional and spiritual dimensions of making art. And these workshops were going to be like a tour around America, basically. And she ended up canceling all of them because they just she just had visions, she claims, that were just too big. There was no way they could ever happen. And then she brought two of them to her New York City apartment. And people actually went. <laughs> but I think they went for like the disaster of it. Yeah. And they made flower crowns. Yeah. <laughs> And also the concept of the book deal that she was offered was really an expansion on her Instagram captions. That yeah. was kind of how her writing began to get traction. And then that was kind of the story, the mythology or lore of Caroline Calloway at Cambridge and yeah. American in the UK was kind of really the premise of the book so she kind of had like a foot in the door with the content that she was like expected to create and then she like fully did a 180 being like they only wanted me to focus on my relationships and then later she was like no I just had an Adderall addiction yeah totally and the cancellation of these creativity workshops was what she considers the moment that she was branded a scammer and the moment that she was officially canceled which is interesting because Natalie's essay which I'll get to in a second came out just a couple months later and mm. I, I would say that was her cancellation oh that was definitely the moment but she really thinks I mean I guess that this the the mainstream coverage of her creativity workshops set the stage for her to be truly canceled from Natalie's essay well and I think that's when Natalie pitched the story to the cut Right. Was when she was blowing up yes. from the creativity workshops being like, I can guarantee that this is going to do well. Like now is the moment to capitalize on yeah. this stage, like you said, that has been set. Yeah. So the cancellation of these workshops, like we said, gained really public attention when reporter Kaylee Donaldson created a Twitter thread that gained news coverage comparing Caroline's tour to Fire Festival. She was called a one woman fire festival <laughs> off the back of this. Uh, yeah. Um, and she was also called the Gatsby of Cambridge or something oh my god because, like all for show yes. and like no substance yeah yeah and also she was running these creativity workshops in an effort to like start to repay the book advance yes. that she had taken a hundred thousand dollars of and like essentially had to refund them because she didn't yeah. deliver on anything so she was scrambling at this point too I feel like yeah. it was definitely like a desperate like a move made out of desperation and then obviously she like could not yes totally through. and caroline also offered uh t-shirts for sale with the caption stop hate following me kaylee across the front after this twitter thread blew up also the weirdest thing ever about this whole situation is she actually credits her entire career blowing up to jonah hill oh yeah <laughs> because jonah hill retweeted kaylee's twitter thread and so that actually is what made mainstream outlets pick it up because it was all of a sudden like randomly on Jonah Hill's Twitter platform. Everyone was like, why does Jonah Hill care about this woman? We have to care about this woman. Yeah. And then he deleted his retweet like an hour later, she said. But she's like, it's so weird because Jonah Hill literally like gave me a career. What the fuck? It, Her life has so much weird shit going on. But that also tracks for Jonah Hill. <laughs> that actually does. He was just so funny and random. <laughs> like thinking about him being kind of like deep into the lore of like chronically online influencers. Like oh, he is definitely chronically online. Yeah. Him and his sister, Benny Feldstein, yeah. like they're, I can just picture them yes. as being the most chronically online celebrities. Yeah, me too. 
Okay, so between 2017 and 2019, Caroline became really famous in a niche way. L. Hunt for The Guardian wrote of this, quote, true to fragmented internet fame, Calloway still has little name recognition beyond her own following and the small subsection of society who consider themselves extremely online. Of them, however, many will know everything there is to know about her. And now I actually sit into that category. I feel like I know everything about Caroline Calloway. But I actually was reading this thinking that's exactly the same with Trisha Paytas. Like, people don't know who she is, but if you follow her, you either are hate followers her because but you still know like everything about her or you're following her because you love her and she's like such an enigma and they're so similar like you follow for like the confusion and the chaos because you're watching these two unhinged blonde women thinking are you real or is this all just a shtick yeah because you're clearly getting something from it like it whether it's real or not at the end of the day too is redundant if you're making a career out of it like if trisha and caroline genuinely don't care about you know the reputation of it all because Mm -hmm. they're both clearly like have terrible reputations Mm -hmm. on again off again then they're actually incredibly successful career women in a way Mm -hmm. so it's like putting those two pieces together being like has everything just fallen into place for them or not but like regardless they're making so much money yeah like are we just duped or is this like a strategy I think at this point too she had like 800,000 followers like she was she she had really kind of solidified herself in the internet space and by now obviously that's not like a massive measure of influence but I think in the Instagram days Mm -hmm. too and like starting so early I think she had definitely solidified herself as like an influencer that people cared about and then for all this like unhinged stuff to be like snowballing yeah so during this time as Caroline tried to sell these workshops to help pay back her book advance Her life was turned upside down when her former bestie, Natalie, dropped an essay for The Cut, claiming she had ghostwritten many of Caroline's famous captions and even helped ghostwrite her book pitch. Let's talk about the essay. This essay, too, was the most viewed article, the most read article on The Cut for like two years, I think, after it was published. Like it was so incredibly viral and successful. I don't think we've seen anything else like it. No, it was. Yeah, it just it penetrated every single corner of mainstream like popularity even if you had no idea who these women were that's the thing I think this was the point where most people heard Caroline Calloway's name for the first time totally so in September 2019 the cut published quote I was Caroline Calloway by Natalie Beach her essay detailed their toxic friendship and exposed Caroline's alleged grift claiming that Natalie had ghostwritten much of Caroline's work the essay went viral and the lore of Caroline Calloway was well and truly solidified. Now, Natalie herself is very controversial. I think at the time, people didn't have the best taste in their mouth for Caroline. She'd scammed a lot of people out of money. She hadn't refunded a lot of people for the money that they'd spent on different products and stuff that Mm. she was trying to sell. So people did not like Caroline. So when this came out, people were so down to jump on the bandwagon of like pro Natalie. Mm -hmm. Natalie has since become a lot more controversial as we've had a bit of distance from this. So the essay, I want to read how it starts because I think this kind of uh, sets the stage for how Natalie has described their narrative or portrayed their narrative to the public. So she wrote, when I was a sophomore in college, I took a creative nonfiction workshop and met a girl who was everything I wasn't. The point of the class was to learn to write your own story. But from the moment we met, I focused instead on helping her tell her own, first in notes after workshop, then later editing her Instagram captions and co-writing a book proposal she sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It seems obvious now, the way the story would end, but when I first met Caroline Calloway, all I saw was the beginning of something extraordinary. (laughs) So from the very beginning of this essay, Natalie really positions Caroline as this kind of like IRL manic pixie dream girl who is just so magnetic and carefree and just so enthralling to be around. And she positions herself as kind of this like dorky friend who got Got manipulated into like sticking by Caroline. She really like strips herself of her own agency and drives home that Caroline did this to her. Like Caroline manipulated her despite throughout the essay writing about how she followed Caroline throughout all these different endeavors. And then she quite literally used her story to launch Natalie's career. Like she was flying 
all over the world to meet Caroline, like, where she was too. Like, yeah. you have to be, like, spending your own money. Like, mm. the victim mentality of it all was very evident. Yes. So the rehashed podcast referred to Natalie's essay as very, quote, she wears short skirts, I wear t-shirts. And, and that's that's how I see it. Like, she's trying to position Caroline as, like, the pretty popular girl that we all love to hate. It's kind of pick me. Yeah, it is pick me. Before <laughs> pick me was a true term, yeah. <laughs> it is definitely pick me. Because now it's a true term. Yeah. In the vernacular. Yes. So another quote from her essay, she says, she turned in personal essay Says about heartbreak in boarding school, had silk eyelashes, and wore cashmere sweaters without a bra. She seemed like an adult, someone who had just gone ahead and constructed a life of independence. I, meanwhile, was a virgin with a meek ponytail, living in a railroad, railroad apartment that was sinking into the Gowanus Canal. Celebrity Memoir Book Club podcast notes that despite this narrative, Natalie was also a casual Nepo baby and she's out here pretending that she was like this underprivileged writer that like yeah. was trying to make it on her own and had no money. Yeah, like literally no money. Like yeah. she was saying that she had to move when Caroline was at Cambridge. She asked if she could move into Caroline's empty West Village apartment to live because she like couldn't afford rent. Like that's yeah. kind of how desperate she positioned herself at the end of their relationship. And then Caroline was saying in one of the interviews that I was listening to that she, I mean, she's like, I didn't know the ins and outs of her financials, obviously, but she was being paid by me. She got paid for the book advance, for mm. example. She so, got 18,000 USD, I think. Yeah. So she was like, I know, like there, Natalie has this section in her essay about this night in Amsterdam where that kind of was like the straw that broke the camel's back mm -hmm. for them. And she was locked out of their hotel room or something like that. And Natalie's like, I was just wandering around, ended up sleeping in a bus shelter. And Caroline's like, I know that specifically at that time she had $18,000 in her bank account. Yeah. Like I'd just given her the check like yeah. a couple of days before. So Natalie's aunt is actually Lucy Kalin, who is the editor in chief of Oprah magazine. And Natalie's first job out of university was the book critic, 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 not assistant, not editorial assistant, junior. not junior book critic for O magazine, like a national magazine. Like that's insane. Yeah. So like, that's not to say like, we obviously don't know Natalie's financials and maybe she needed that $18,000 and spent it right away on uni Student or like debt, whatever. Yeah. yeah exactly. And we also know that media is not a particularly well-paying industry, but that foot in the door for media is often the hardest part to, you know, set the scene or, you know, elevate your career. So the fact that she had that foot in the door and was still using like a toxic, scathing essay yes. to like launch her career just doesn't sit right. With and a there lot of was people. so many issues with the essay like that people have now. She wrote about Caroline's mental health and her Adderall addiction before Caroline had really spoken about that publicly herself, which is just so gross. Like that's mm. just, it's just sad to see in general how these two women, because Caroline is doing similarly bad shit yeah, so we're not, to Natalie now. We will not at the end be defending Caroline. <laughs> no, no. But it's sad to see these two women who were best friends at one point and would have shared so much of each other, about each other in this kind of what they would have assumed at the time was like a safe space. Mm. And for now them to both be like weaponizing this against each other in such a public way. Well, and for financial gain too, like it's mm. reputation and finances. Like it really is just proving how much they used each other and how toxic and bad they were for each other more than anything. You know, nobody has come out of this the winner, which is kind of yes. almost sadder because then like, what was the point? Yeah. I mean, and it's funny to listen to Caroline talk about it now. Cause she's like, I am the winner. Like, cause Natalie just released a book the same week as Caroline's book just came out. And Caroline's like all of her press, like my face is in the header images mm. and stuff. She has to still be using my likeness. Whereas like Natalie is like not even part of my narrative anymore. And it's just so funny to, to listen to her talk about how she feels like she's come out on top. And I understand what she's saying to an extent, but I think all of this back and forth has just proven that both of these women are just really shitty friends. Oh, totally. And the fact that because of this you know, escalating to the level that it did, 
you had to lay absolutely everything on the table yourself before the other person did it. Yeah, that's true. So that's like you literally are selling your soul to get ahead of the other person and like whether or not you were ready to share those parts of like your experience or your journey or whatever to the public for financial gain is like maybe not – like it will maybe catch up with them later Mm -hmm. because they weren't ready to do that or like it's hitting them harder than they thought Mm -hmm. or they've opened themselves up to all this criticism from their audience. Like there's so many ramifications of those being the circumstances that you kind of share that information under and you are really vulnerable. Yes. And I think what Natalie's essay did more than anything was really depict this like codependent toxic relationship that the two of them were in. Mm -hmm. So a couple days after Natalie's essay was published, Caroline's father was found dead in his apartment from suicide. And according to Caroline, Natalie called her on the day that her father was found and tried to exploit her in this very vulnerable spot, asking her to come on board for a film adaptation of their friendship and including Caroline's life for $15,000. Caroline later found out that Natalie was offered $1 million. So Caroline was going to get 15,000 and Natalie was allegedly going to get 1 million for this. Caroline later said too, that if she signed on, the deal would be worth a million. And if she didn't, the deal would only be worth a hundred thousand. So like, it was very crucial for like Natalie, if this was a direction that she was going to take for Caroline to be like signed on. And Caroline said that when she called her, she thought she was calling to give her condolences. And she did, I guess she says, you know, we talked about my dad for a little bit and she basically said, okay, if you sign on to this project, the slate is clean. Let's like wipe the slate clean. I forgive you. You forgive me. Let's like go to ground zero. And I guess obviously Caroline said no. Yeah, I mean, I would have said no probably. But Caroline was like, I really need $15,000. So because (laughs) this was kind of the biggest moment of like cancellation for her in theory. So she had to pay back, as we mentioned, the $100,000 book advance to her publisher that she blew through. And she said on the Be There in Five podcast that she knew the best way for her to make money was through her writing, which is hilarious because she literally (laughs) at this point had not written anything that (laughs) Natalie hadn't like co or ghost written. But her publisher owned her life rights up until 2016 unless she paid back the advance it really limited the life experience that she actually had to pull from and write about and I'm actually curious when we say owned her life rights from a publisher perspective there was also the rumor going around that Lena Dunham owned her the life rights for a film about her yeah I think she still does (laughs) so yeah I think Lena Dunham owns the life rights to make Caroline Calloway's story into Mm. a film. So no one else can touch that at the moment. Yeah, right. So like if a different production company wants to make like a docu-series on her, they can't. Right. But this publisher owned the rights, like book rights. Yeah, publishing rights, I guess. Right. And she went on the Celebrity Memoir Book Club podcast and was like defending Lena Dunham to the death and nobody could understand why she felt this strongly about this woman. Like everyone was like, she's kind of controversial. Like it's actually fine. Like you can just say what you want. And it was later revealed that it's because she like is in theory owing her potential future film career to Lena Dunham. So it's just been this like bizarre kind of background story that everyone like remembers every now and again that her and Lena Dunham are like weirdly linked. No, but the funniest thing is that the Celebrity Memoir Book Club girls did a podcast like ripping Lena Dunham's book to shreds and Caroline Calloway DM'd them being like, you have it wrong. Let me come on and like debate you on this. And so they're like, okay, sick. This is like amazing. This is so random. It's so funny. (laughs) so as a result of having to pay back this advance and obviously having limited experience that she could pull from to actually put something literary into the world she started selling nudes on OnlyFans. the point of difference for caroline's content is that she dressed up as literary characters for a very specific niche so she was really leaning into you know dressing up as juliet capulet or like harry potter characters and she said in an interview that she was creating content for the princeton to wall street pipeline kind of version of men which is just so hilarious like they're watching normal porn so she said in interviews that her intention to enter the adult entertainment industry had been planned by playboy and that the magazine had commissioned a photo shoot of her dress as a student in a library when asked the magazine said quote playboy does not have and did not have any photo shoot planned with caroline calloway um and then on top of this kind of as an additional revenue stream she started selling face oil that she called snake oil so she was allegedly bottling this in her apartment and this 
was a very bad move for her because <laughs> many people complained that there was cat hair in their bottles when they received their orders. A bunch of other people went to like fair trade or whatever the overarching body is to say that they never even received their oil after they paid for it. So snake oil also made the news, but like mm-hmm. – Mildly. It it was just such a random, like, flash in the pan in the scheme of all her scams. It's just so funny because, like, influencers and celebrities do these quick cash grabs all the time. Mm -hmm. But Caroline can't even do that right. Like, she can't (laughs) even deliver on that. Yeah. I can't. (laughs) Okay, so... After this failed 2016 book deal that landed her $100,000 in debt that she was trying with OnlyFans and Snake Oil to kind of recoup, she finally shared that she was planning to capitalize on the virality of Natalie's essay for the cut by releasing a response in the form of a memoir titled Scammer. So this became the announcement that Caroline would finally be publishing her debut novel, landing in the summer of 2020. And while the book itself didn't come to fruition in 2020, she did publish a three-part essay titled I Am Caroline Calloway behind a paywall on her website in early 2020 with the proceeds going towards direct relief, which I believe is a, was a COVID relief charity. Um, and right. she allegedly raised $50,000. But why wouldn't she take that money for herself? I know. She clearly needed it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, uh, yeah, I have no idea. It was so bizarre. Yeah. She was, like, definitely trying to recoup her public image yeah. too, like, after a few failed kind of attempts at being a businesswoman. Mm-hmm. Um, then she ended up justifying pushing out the actual launch of this memoir scammer because of the pandemic so she was kind of set to launch it in 2019 and she was working on it and then came the pandemic in 2020 and she said she didn't feel comfortable releasing a book that was about like the hardest year of her life with the cuts essay being released and with her father dying she was like it's just not the right environment for these people are struggling so much in COVID I just don't feel like it will quite hit but that also was convenient considering she'd actually never released anything before in her life so like yeah, of course, this seems like another kind of excuse in a way. But I think what it actually is, I mean, that's definitely an excuse. And I think that's because she doesn't want to write about the really hard realities of her life because her whole thing is that she lives this fake fairy tale life. Like, Mm. and that's what all of the reviews, so like, we haven't gotten our hands on Scammer and we never will. It will never arrive in Australia. Like there's just absolutely no way. But all the reviews that we've read and the interviews that we've listened to with her since her book has come out, a lot of them say that the book does not focus on her father's death or Natalie's essay as much as we would expect. And mm. a lot of it is just more about like, like this, yeah, like this kind of, and it's like people really like her writing. Like mm. they th- think it's really beautiful and stuff, but it's like this construction of herself as a scammer, as opposed to like the reality of what she's been through. Yes, Like it's a construction of how she would like to be perceived and the character that she's created for herself yeah. rather than genuine experiences. So that's why I think she did and actually release that book that she's claiming she like was going to because she doesn't want to dive into those really traumatic experiences that much because that's not the narrative of Caroline Calloway. It's not the law of Caroline yes. Calloway. So even though she didn't release this book in 2020 as she said she was going to, she had began accepting pre-orders for the book from January of 2019 or 2020 regardless no book ever came so she then went on a long break from social media and allegedly returned about half of the initial pre-order money to everyone who requested refunds then as she tells Rolling Stone in a recent profile she said over the next two years people just very reasonably lost faith that this book would ever exist and like same girl Mm. four years later Caroline's first and self-published memoir Scammer was officially being released and sold for pre-order of her, quote, luxury first edition on her website for $65. According to her Instagram captions, the book was set to be mailed out to reviewers on June 12th and available to the public on June 16th, which she has said she expects to be packing and sending consumer orders throughout July. She's also said in an interview on Celebrity Memoir Book Club that she finally got her shit together to release the book now because Natalie, like we said, was slated Mm -hmm. to be releasing a book and she had to beat her to it, which is so like it just feels like you should be so far past this but like obviously not I mean Natalie basically ruined her life so I kind of get it but she's also like the worst Caroline yeah (laughs) 
<laughs> She's the best to me. She's I, the best. I am a stan. She also said, interestingly, that after the cut essay was released, Natalie's essay, mm -hmm. she got a ton of book mm. and film deals and that she actually ended up choosing, making the decision to self-publish because she didn't want to quote unquote scam anyone else. Like mm -hmm. she wanted it to be entirely within her own control. She didn't want to disappoint anyone else. She really wanted to try and like we said before, like recoup her reputation. And this was one way that she felt like she could do that. Yeah. She was like, if the thought of having emails in my inbox from a publisher asking for pages, like gives me hives. Like that is just like, it brings me back to the time when I was in the throes of my addiction and like pushing off my book deal and mm. stuff, which I understand, but also like, is that true? Or is it actually because nobody trusts to give you a book deal because you fucked up the first one? Yeah, truly. And like so publicly. So the book is about 158 pages and is broken into chapters. Some as short as a couple of lines. As Ellen Scott writes for Stylist, when I saw this news I thought something along the lines of I would actually like to read this but no way am I sending someone $65 for a book that may not even be real then in May Calloway posted a story to her Instagram if you write about pop culture for any of these publications DM me and I will give you a luxury first edition of Scammer to review one of the publications she tagged was Stylist hence why Ellen Scott managed to get her hands on this book it has been fairly well received so far which is actually really surprising mm -hmm. so Rolling Stone says the 158 pages she crafted as delicious, even as much of the book is a rehash of what those paying attention already knew or already assumed. Galas at castles, trips to Italy, France, Vienna, book deals, sex, her father's suicide, her drug addiction, her depression. But some of it is new, like her exploration of her bisexuality and her writing about the experience of actually dating women. Some of the biggest takeaways from the book, and like we said, we will not probably ever be able to read it, so we're <laughs> taking what we can get, but the scamminess and the scam scandal of it all. So Caroline mentions things like, and I'm paraphrasing, but if you've never been touched by a scandal, avoid it at all costs. But if you have, then you have to do it times a billion to make it a shrug of the shoulders like Donald Trump or the Kardashians. Say and do so many outrageous things that people can't keep track. So Ellen writes for Stylist, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here about the distinction between lying, scamming and falseness versus being an active creator of your identity and life's path. If you have such a set vision of who you want to be, is it problematic to play untruth and deceit to fit into that frame? And I feel like that's really at the crux of Caroline, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is she actually a scammer mm -hmm. or is she just like a liar that made some bad decisions very publicly? Totally. I think she takes on whatever people project onto her, especially if it's mainstream media. So if it's a journalist writing for Vanity Fair, if it's, you know, kind of, because that's what she wants at the mm. end of the day. She wants to be famous in a legitimate way at all costs. Mm -hmm. So if it's somebody that she considers legitimate, putting a label on her, she will accept that. And so all of these mainstream publications were calling her a scammer for all of 2019. And so suddenly she comes out with a book called Scammer. And she's like, ha, I'm a scammer. I'm a grifter. And it's like, you actually aren't. Like, people are grouping her now with like Elizabeth Holmes and like people that have done really bad fucking shit like Anna Delvey people that have gone to prison yeah literally all she did was pull out of her book deal I would not be surprised if artists are not plagued a lot of the time by like addiction mental illness and they can't finish things like book deals oh totally you know? like deadlines are like semi-arbitrary for every creative person yeah. like genuinely creative person yeah. that I know I'm like everyone I know in you know the art world or like the literary world like anyone I went to school with I can guarantee you have the worst time management of anyone I've ever met. Yeah. And she was obviously in the throes of addiction as well at that time. I also think, you know, she sold these creativity workshops. She claims that anyone who asked for a refund got it. I don't know if that means that everyone got a refund, but apparently if you asked for one, you got it. I just think she is a girl who is absolutely so desperate to be famous and so desperate for external validation in a way that she considers legitimate. And sorry, also, this is kind of an aside, but she kind of dove into on the Be There in Five podcast why this world she feels gives her that like le legitimate validation. And mm. that's because that's the world that her father was so close to because he was so smart. Mm. And so she's like being in these circles and being in these spaces that are so considered like the upper echelon of intelligence mm -hmm. makes me feel closer to my dad because that was the part of my dad that I loved because he was so wrought with mental health issues. Yeah, right. So 
I feel like she is so desperate to be in these spaces, to be famous for this validation. Whatever will get her there, she will take on. She's happy to adopt. And a big component of that is the internet fame and a big kind of part of the conversation that Celebrity Memoir Book Club was having as well is like what is the morality of being obsessed with internet fame and it's something that we say to women that like you know you share too much online Mm. you want attention too badly but for her like you know that transition from influencer to like intellectual Mm. and like her book is not you know she's not writing like war and peace like it's not she's never going to be taken a literary icon of her generation but I do think she always saw each kind of failed or like each misstep as a stepping stone to get Mm. closer to her goal yeah I see her as like you know on TikTok everybody's like just be a little delulu about your life like that is her embodied she's just ahead of her time she was doing the delulu shit like years ago She's also like, you know, everyone is so bothered about the lying element of it all. But I think at the end of the day, it's the same thing we see with creators now. You're building a character. Yeah, totally. You are not the version of yourself that you project. And that is so many people in so many circumstances, but specifically creators that we see like now at this point in time, they have to create a different version of themselves than how they are like in their own spaces because that's what makes money. Mm -hmm. So I think like you said, she was just like really early days at like creating this idea of her life. And also Instagram in the early days was very aspirational so she was mm-hmm. kind of taking that early Instagram mentality which has only come crumbling down recently and she's kind of followed the pathway from aspirational to like a vulnerable and authentic mm-hmm. like she has actually moved with the punches yeah. a bit more successfully than we maybe give her credit for also anyone who's a Caroline Calloway fan at this point is a fan because of the blurred lines mm-hmm. between the human and the character and because of the like dichotomy of her and the chaos around her like that's why you're a fan of Caroline Calloway you're not a fan of her Instagram captions yeah. you know you're a fan of this cre- uh, this character that you that she's created but you're aware that she's created this character and yes. that you don't know where kind of she ends and the character starts and so I think it is weird that we have such contempt for her in a lot of ways mm. because it's not that different than what a lot of people do on the public stage oh completely I mean, one of the components that people were really bothered about in the book was the queerness of it all. So many people feel like the overt kind of queerness in the book, Caroline shared her bisexual awakening. People feel like that was in a response to Natalie's essay that people feel Caroline took advantage of Natalie knowing kind of underlying that Natalie was in love with her or that, you know, became kind of part of the narrative that was being told. And then Caroline has kind of flipped that on its head in the book and has talked about how she was in love with Natalie Mm -hmm. to try and reverse the power dynamic. So it seemed like she was taking advantage of Natalie less and that Natalie actually had all the power because she was in love with her. Yeah. So I think that feels like that's a part that people are kind of stuck on is that that doesn't feel truly authentic, which is I ironic because like nothing we know about her is like real or fake or authentic or non-authentic in any way. We have no idea. Um, But people feel like this recollection of her bisexual awakening feels icky because she's weaponizing her sexuality to turn the tables on Natalie. Yeah, it does feel like it's another label that she's absorbing because the Vanity Fair journalist that wrote a really big profile on her before her book came out spent like, I think two years with her. Mm -hmm. And she said to her at one point, your relationship with Natalie was like gothic lesbian. And then Caroline literally was obsessed with that and then started talking about how her relationship with Natalie was gothic lesbian and then wrote about how she was in love with Natalie throughout her book. You know, yeah. like it's, it's almost like she was like, oh my God, yes. Like that is <laughs> this what This is was. my awakening. Yeah. And of course, like we're not going to speculate on her sexual orientation. And I do believe she, she said now she's exclusively dating girls. And like, I believe that. Like, I'm not going to question that. But I think it's another example of the fact that she's so, easily she has like stars in her eyes for whoever in the world she considers legitimate and it seems like it is mainstream media Mm -hmm. journalists that write for these really powerful publications to be care to be care to be fair if vanity fair titled me anything I would probably (laughs) I would take it on (laughs) (laughs) for sure but in the very end of the book apparently she added a few lines which 
according to Celebrity Memoir Book Club, must have been added like weeks before it went into production talking about how she's started to date girls and how mm. she's dating exclusively girls. And everyone was like, it just felt like such a um, like capitalization of the yeah. moment to prove, be like, see all this stuff that I did to Natalie was all in the name of love and I can prove it because now I'm dating girls. Like totally. it does feel like a bit of a band aid, but like, like we said, it's not the fact that her sexuality is or isn't, you know, what she says it is. It's the, overt promotion of it in the circumstances. Uh, but she also did have some bad reviews, even though more than I was expecting were glowing. Yeah. ID wrote, it's a dazzling piece from an author whose legacy precedes her. Taken out of the shadow of this legacy, it is a book that is very good at the beginning, very good at the end, and fatally mediocre in the <laughs> middle. And this is kind of the point that I personally, the side that I personally fall on, is that I'm surprised that anyone – thinks it's good because I thought that because she was so obsessed with being a good writer and like I said she had this opportunity mm -hmm. to become a successful writer literally laid out in front of her and obviously she was going through the most but she's mentioned that she couldn't face her own mediocrity by writing the first draft and why she struggled to submit anything to her initial publishers for that first deal so I am surprised at the end of the day she managed to put out something that didn't feel like a joke because in my mind mm -hmm. I really had constructed the idea that she hadn't put anything out because she literally was just a bad writer. Yeah, I can see that. And I mean, why would we think any differently when Natalie was out here saying that she basically wrote a lot of her captions, which Caroline to this day, like vehemently denies, like she doesn't deny that they worked together on stuff and she doesn't deny that she was part of her book pitch um, or that they did collaborate on captions. But she's like, I own the rights to like most of my captions because mm. I did write a lot of them myself. But Natalie kind of changed that narrative for us yeah and she did say because people were saying you know um the celebrity memoir book club girls were saying that do you have what do you have in the works coming up mm. and she said I do hope to be like putting out more yeah. books in the future but this I'm not trying to clear my name I'm just trying to respond to the reality of my life and this is not a book I should put out in 10 years this is the appropriate book for right now and I feel like she did hit the nail on the head. Like this is what people needed, especially if she was going to sustain this like lore about her yeah. and really kind of feed into the questions and storyline. And I, at the end of the day too, I don't think she even knows the difference between her character and herself. No. Like because she spent so long, all she wants to do is write a memoir because she wants to be an interesting enough person to have a memoir. And so mm. that's King Towards her whole life is having this narrative that is worthy of a memoir. And so she spent her time on social media building this persona, which is why Scammer made the most sense for her to release. I mean, that's not true. Like we said before, actually a book about 2019 is actually what she should have released and well, actually what, what she should have written. Her family life apparently is going to come next. But mm -hmm. like you said, I do wonder if that's ever going to happen because it seems to be clear that she – struggles to really like self-analyze and yeah. grapple with like what she went through in that time and I it's it's pretty wild that we look at her and we dissect her and we kind of question why she's such a liar and why she's like this and it's like I don't question that at all she has had a very traumatic life mm. she doesn't present that way she you know talks about it in kind of a pretty chill way, I would say. Not like an airy-fairy way, but, you know, she doesn't give it the gravity that I think it probably deserves when she does these interviews and does talk about her father's death and her father's mental health problems growing up. Like, she lived in a full-on hoarder house. Mm. And she talked about, in I think it was 2019 or whenever she was moving out of her apartment. Actually, maybe it was like 2021, um, when she was moving out of her New York apartment to go to Florida. Mm -hmm. And people started releasing photos of her apartment and how, like, it was just, like, a shithole and she kept it up so poorly. And she said like my baseline for comfort is so low and yeah. she didn't say my baseline for hygiene but I also know that's what she kind of meant mm. she grew up in this really chaotic dirty unhealthy environment mm. in like a hoarder house where she said I was sleeping in the most disgusting uncomfortable places for so much of my childhood like she actually has a genuine story to tell but it's not the story she wants to tell oh completely and like we were saying one of the things that was kind of most confusing but also most interesting is she has these elements that are so rags to riches mm -hmm. but then she also was like very kind of like a nebo baby privileged yeah. in a lot of other ways like going to exeter but mm -hmm. growing up in a hoarder house are like polar opposite yeah. ends of the spectrum as far as your upbringing and 
she said this quote that we think is like so poignant, but she said, one of the worst things you can be is a member of the upper middle class that is desperate to be more well off. And she was constantly like grappling with Mm -hmm. the fact that she kind of sat in the middle and everything was going well, but she was like constantly chasing this higher form of like society and intellect and exclusivity. But then she's also so like controversial and pedestrian at the same time. Yeah. And that accessibility is what we feel like maybe makes her Mm -hmm. so fascinating because they feel like run of the mill. I could just go and start selling snake oil tomorrow. Yeah, totally. Like Anna Delvey was scamming like literal banks, like millions of dollars. Like she was so much more audacious than I could ever consider for myself as like being in the realm of possibility whereas Caroline Calloway I'm like maybe we could sell a book pitch (laughs) well that's why like Caroline Calloway getting lumped in with these genuine scammers like these were sophisticated like strategic plans Mm. Caroline feels like you said kind of pedestrian or accessible because we can all see ourselves in Caroline Calloway she says kind of the quiet part out loud where it's like yeah I have a great life but I want to be richer I like glitz and glam. Like I like the nice things in life and I want that. And it's very taboo to admit that publicly. Mm. And the fact that she just goes all in and that is literally her brand so unabashedly is really refreshing in a lot of ways, Mm. but it makes her unlikable. Yeah, completely. I mean, like, I was going to say same. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) of course same. (laughs) Yeah, of course. But that's the thing. Everybody wants that, but nobody feels comfortable saying that. And that's why that quote we really like where she says, like, whatever, she says, nothing is worse than being being upper middle class, but wanting to be more well off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it is It's relatable. It's super relatable, but it's also super unlikable based on, you know- what we know about capitalism. <laughs> yeah. So right now, especially, and that really speaks to why she wanted to be in the UK, why she wanted to be mm-hmm. in England, because that really has like old money mm-hmm. privilege kind of steeped in the culture, yeah. whereas Americanism feels like new money, new money to yeah. a co- like to its core. But what is next for her is she's basically just doing interview rounds for her like kind of semi mm-hmm. press tour of her book, which have been very mixed. Okay. I... I'm so happy that in hindsight, we had to record this later because Jordi and I basically split like the interviews and the content that we would consume. And then I listened to one of the interviews that was like your listening celebrity Mm -hmm. memoir book club because we both listened to their recap of her book, but then she did an interview on their podcast and I listened to be there in five. But this morning I listened to her interview on celebrity memoir book club and I'm so surprised at your perception of it because I feel the complete opposite oh my god okay so how did you feel about it I felt so uncomfortable and you know the celebrity memoir book club girls are they're great interviewers they go in hard they're not letting anybody off with easy answers to their questions but Caroline said at the beginning that she felt this was the interview that she was most nervous about she was really stressed she almost didn't know why uh, but she had an existing relationship with the girls too, with the host. So it kind of started off, you know, they were, she said, you know, we're friends, right? Like you came to my farewell party before I moved to Florida. Mm-hmm. And then she was like, well, one of you did. And the other girl was like, I was there too. What do you mean? She goes, oh, oh, sorry, I was on drugs. <laughs> like, but she kept doubling down or backtracking and they were just pushing her really hard. They're like, what do you mean you went from your internship in DC back to Yale every night? She was like, I didn't go every night. I went maybe like six times. They said, you really couldn't go any more than twice. Like that is an insane trip to do. Like you're <laughs> lying about that. She was like, okay, yeah, maybe I went less than six times. But she kept backtracking and being confused about the answers she was giving. And it made me so uncomfortable. I was like, she just didn't present as the charismatic mm. version of her that, you know, had sucked all these people into like the quote unquote grift. But that's because she doesn't have a grift and she sucked no one in because of her personality. <laughs> she sucked us in because of the lore and the chaos, you know? And I think when I was listening, okay, so what I was saying yesterday when we recorded this episode is that on Be There in Five, I was really... Really, I understood why she got to where she is because she was very complimentary Mm. to Kate. And, you know, she would say things like, oh, my God, I want to hear about your book. I can't wait to hear about it. Like, what's it about? Um, Kate would ask her a question and she would be like, that's a really great question. Thank you so much for asking that question. I found her to be like really complimentary. I don't know if charismatic would be how I described her, but 
I, I found her to be quite likable, but I, when I was listening to Celebrity Memoir Book Club, I actually found it to be completely different. Like they were pushing her on the hard questions and those were super valid questions. But I actually thought she answered them all really well. I was like, I completely understand what you're saying because she's basically saying this book is not like a factual recount of my life. Like it is the vibe of my life. Yes, completely. Like I don't discount the fact that she kind of managed them well, Mm -hmm. but she basically admitted to the fact that like everything is built on a lie. And like, obviously we kind of know that, but it's still seems insane to hear her admit that and it's it's interesting because I think you know watching the Shondaland documentary on Anna Delvey like inventing documentary watching the Shondaland (laughs) show on Anna Delvey like or Elizabeth Holmes like none of them were particularly charismatic at the end of the day I just think I expected her to be that but Mm. I agree that it's definitely more the law and the narrative and the story that she's built about herself that has sucked people in more than her as a person like Mm. Natalie is the only person that's really painted her in that like super charismatic light so I guess yeah I was just a bit taken aback but I do think it's a very good listen once I got past the initial like jarringness of it I just like didn't I just (laughs) I don't know. This is going to sound so unhinged, but like, I just didn't think she was lying about anything. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Even when they were like, okay, well, this is a lie. So, and she would backtrack. I was like, I understand. Maybe I just see too much of myself in Caroline Calloway. Oh my God. (laughs) Which is like such a bad thing to say, but I just, I don't know when she was like, okay, well like, no, the point is that I was so obsessed with Yale that I wanted to sleep there every night. Like I did it, you know, once or twice, you know, but of course I couldn't have done it anymore. And they were like, well, then why would you write that you were doing it every night? But like, I got that. I was like, I understand what you're saying. And I don't, I don't believe that she is intentionally lying. Well, the point that she made that I thought was really interesting was she said, I didn't embellish any parts of the story that were crucial to the story. Mm. I embellished the parts of the story that I felt I could and they brought, they added something Mm -hmm. without changing the direction or pathway of my life. Like they didn't actually, um, like they weren't crucial elements. And I thought that was a really important distinction that she was like, yeah, a lot of it wasn't true. But then she sucks you in and being like, but all the important parts were true. And I was like, well, why the fuck would I believe you? (laughs) I don't know. I just believe everything she says. I just, I'm converted. I love her. Oh my God. She is so scary to me. She's just like us. She's just like us. She's just like us. Some of the other unhinged, unrelated things that she said over the years is that she doesn't have kneecaps. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, no, that we is. We just a have lie. to bring these up. I, I, that is the one thing she has said that I do not believe. She also said that she met Margaret Qualley one time in the book, allegedly, she says this. Uh, that she met Margaret Qualley one time and she had a black eye because she'd punched herself in the face to feel something after her and Pete Davidson broke up and she had a conversation with Margaret Qualley that she was going to be the only person that could ever play her in a film about Caroline Calloway, like that could play her as herself. And it was just the funniest. Apparently she just has this obsession, which to be honest, like we do, Mm -hmm. this obsession with proximity to like genuine celebrities. Uh, But there's just a few hilarious tidbits throughout. Like she says her kneecaps don't stop her. Her lack of kneecaps don't stop her from doing anything except dancing. Makes no sense. How are you walking properly without kneecaps? What is capping your knees? How are they not falling out? No, how are they bending? How are your knees bending? It makes no sense sense that's horrific truly. no it's so gross no yeah that's the one thing I believe she's lying about <laughs> I just I don't know I just find her so fascinating but so relatable and that is like literally why I love someone like as problematic and fucked up as Trisha Paytas because I just I find it so relatable yeah I find <laughs> I find it the opposite I find it so overwhelming to unpack and mm. I don't like not being able to get to the bottom of it I don't like not knowing fact from fiction Mm. like same with Trisha I'm like it drives me fucking crazy not knowing if this is her or if this is a shtick yeah no see I feel the opposite I kind of love it I'm like this is so fun (laughs) but I find it intriguing at the same time because you know conspiracy theory 
girlies girlies but i definitely think listen to be there in five we'll put it in the show notes listen to celebrity memoir book club interview and let us know what you think in the geneva chat because team lauren or team jordan as far as your take on caroline (laughs) calloway please don't come for me i know she's problematic i just i can't resist a problematic blonde I just love them. Okay, she's literally so popular for a reason, right? Like so many people have made episodes on her because like for the most part people find her incredibly intriguing. So I don't think you're in the minority. And in the scheme of problematic influencers – She's pretty fucking low. She's not hurting anyone. No. And a lot of people were having the conversation of whether or not she's dangerous when I think the creativity workshops or the snake oil or something was coming out. Like, no. Like, no. I know we hold different standards for influencers selling products now, mm. but I also think, you know, like, she had a problematic history. You were choosing to spend, like, if you were choosing to spend $165 on a creativity workshop, <laughs> it was probably disposable income. Yes. And I... Yeah, exactly. And especially anybody that is buying her book now that doesn't receive it or is supporting her monetarily in any way is doing that knowing like the lore of Caroline Calloway. You know you are probably not going to get that book. So you are throwing that $65 away. Yeah, in support of the dream. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening and waiting for this late release episode. We are so grateful and for all your amazing reviews. So if you enjoyed, please remember to let us know, rate, review, and subscribe, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.